Do you want healthy trees and plants while making fewer pesticide and fertilizer applications? Use these essential best management practices as part of a regular maintenance program and you will reap the benefits of a more attractive landscape with less work. These are proven methods that many local parks and campus landscape crews already use. Start with healthy soil for fewer plant problems. Implement maintenance practices that improve the soil physical and biological properties. Plant problems can result from compacted soils, low organic matter, and poor water penetration. It is common for pesticides and fertilizers to be applied to remedy the plant problems when, in fact, improving the soil is the solution. We've really got it backwards when we head out into the garden in the fall and scrape up every last leaf and bit of organic debris down to a smooth raked bare soil surface. The problems that go with that is now we've left that ground exposed to the elements. And so when those hard rains come in the fall, some of that soil is gonna be picked up and washed away. So we're gonna have erosion problems. As that rain beats down really hard, that surface will get compacted and crusted. And so then as the rain continues to fall through the season, it's going to sheet off instead of being absorbed into the ground. The other thing that happens when we do that is we've also starved and robbed the soil of all the nutrients and organic material that would come back from that fallen debris. That's very important for the health of the soil and all the soil organisms um, that live in the soil, which then in turn support the plant roots. An ideal thing to do is just remove enough leaves that are causing problems, but keep some of that organic debris in place where you can. Applying a uh, Leaf mold or wood chips is an ideal practice for fall season. The coarse texture of those materials will provide nice open channels for that rainfall to follow and get into uh, penetrating into the soil. And that's really important for replenishing the profile of soil moisture for the next growing season. The coarse texture of that mulch can take the beating of that rain. And so it's protecting the soil from a harmful compaction that'll happen during the wet seasons of the year, um, whether it's from rainfall or from gardeners needing to walk out in those beds. And then probably one of the most important things is at this time of year, when we keep that coarse organic debris covering the soil, then we're feeding that uh, process of decomposition to return organic matter um, to the ground. We're installing new landscape plantings. We've traditionally put a lot of effort into uh, cultivating and amending and improving that uh, soil before we plant. In a lot of situations, that's an important thing to do. But we're starting to learn that we can also achieve great effect by just working from the top down, which is how nature builds soil. We have the eroded, uh, uh, parent material, the eroded rock and mineral components and living things die and lay down on top of it and as they decompose we end up with the formulation of um, soil over time. So we can tap into that for many landscape situations where we need to improve the soil for new plantings and also when we're trying to improve soil where we might have mature trees that have a network of roots out into that area where cultivating that soil would be harmful to the trees. So what we've learned is if we take uh, materials on the surface, so wood chip mulch applied to the soil and allowed time to decompose, slowly conditions that soil and improves its uh, porosity and improves its organic matter and improves um, its um, structure. And how that's happening is that wood chip mulch feeds the natural soil builders. So we're getting the natural processes to do all of that heavy lifting for us. It's a great method to prepare soil for a new planting bed or to take care of soil that's become degraded in landscapes where we have mature trees and we're not able to cultivate or turn that ground without harming the trees is to do a total surface application of amendments and mulch that replicates 
the natural processes of how nature builds soil profiles. So we can start with a, a, a yard waste compost applied to the soil surface, what might be an inch or two, applied to soil that's uh, crumbly in texture. And then over that compost, apply two to four inches of coarse wood chip mulch. And when we've done that, we've immediately replicated what would happen in a woodland landscape over time as a natural soil profile is built up. It's gonna be higher in organic matter at that top uh, horizon. And then as you move down the soil, it's going to, uh, down in the soil profile, it's going to be less concentrated. Studies have found in soils that are highly degraded, the use of uh, compost that's much higher in nitrogen and uh, biosolids in particular have been shown to be most productive in um, turning that soil around in a shorter time frame. So when we put that nitrogen rich compost at the soil surface, it kick starts those microorganisms that are decomposing that organic matter and they're high nitrogen feeders. So you get a population spike in that group and then they then support the next tier of decomposers that live on them. And so we sort of truncated that process of the decomposition of materials um, and uh, turning into compost at the soil surface. The whole thing is about feeding the soil builders. They're doing all that back baking, breaking work for us and um, building up a better soil structure and adding to the uh, nutrient contents. So we don't always have to do these Herculean efforts to reclaim a soil that's um, become deteriorated for one reason or another. There are many benefits when you maintain landscape beds with coarse organic mulch like wood chips and leaf mold. These organic materials improve soil conditions, plant health, and suppress weeds. The result? Fewer pesticide and fertilizer applications. When choosing a suitable landscape plant, there are many considerations, such as site conditions, pest and disease resistance, and drought tolerance. Inspect for defects before making your plant choices to reduce the development of root problems after planting. When you're starting to think about planting a tree, it's really important to do a site evaluation first. And one of the things you really need to think about first is, are there existing buildings, walkways, patios, or decks? And if there are, you, that's gonna make a difference on what kind of plant you're going to, to select. In some places, you're gonna have wires above ground, so you have to be careful that trees are not going to interfere with that. One of the things that people often worry about when their tree selection is, is there enough sun? Is there too much sun? Is there enough shade? You love a tree that wants shade, but you only have sun. So it's important to decide what kind of light situation you have. I think it's a really good clue of what you can grow in your yard if you look at what's already growing. Sometimes there's things that are growing really successfully, really healthy, and you should try to mimic that if you're trying to select plants to bring into the garden. Plants that aren't doing well, or if there's areas of the landscape that are not doing well, need to be looked at in case there's a problem existing in the soil or with the light or with water conditions. Soil is really important to look at before you start looking for a tree. On your own property, you want to see, do you have good drainage or do you have standing water? Do you have very sandy soil or is your soil very heavy and clay-like? Do you have a large enough area for a large tree to root into or will you need to select something that would be a little bit more, more in, in line with this rooting area that you have? Compaction can be a real problem for trees because they need to get oxygen and if there is not enough oxygen in the root area, they won't be successful. So it's good to identify compacted areas in your garden. One of the things that's really helpful when you're planting a new garden is, especially with trees, is to have available irrigation. You don't have to have irrigation already established, but it's nice to identify if it is already there. Now that you've decided what your site is like, you get to do the fun part and start picking out your tree. You get to decide whether or not you want a conifer or whether you want a broadleaf tree. Broadleaf trees can be either deciduous or they can be evergreen. If you have a deciduous tree, then you have to start thinking about fall color, but also leaf pickup. 
It's often people worry about the height of the tree. Is the tree too tall or is it too short? There isn't a right answer to that. You think about a large tree is going to be over 50 feet tall and a small tree can get as tall as 30 feet, but it's still considered a small tree. Width can be just as important as height. The canopy width can sometimes interfere with buildings. It can interfere with uh, visibility if people are coming down the street. So you do need to consider canopy width. Tree form is a really important thing to look at. If you have a very small space, you might need to look at a narrow formed tree that won't take up as much space. If you have quite a lot of room, you can look at multi-trunked trees and get a wider spread. It's really important to know what function you want that tree to play in your landscape. Are you looking for more privacy or to hide a, a building or a road that you don't want to see? Are you hoping for a lot of shade? If you want shade, you probably want a larger, more spreading or V-shaped tree to provide that shade. Are you looking for just a beautiful tree that is going to give you seasonal interest? Do you want something with fall color? Do you want something that has spring flowers or fruit during the summer? One of the things I like to consider when selecting a tree is how sustainable that tree might be in the future. Am I going to be able to manage the maintenance? So perhaps I want a tree that will require less maintenance. I certainly want a tree that isn't going to get a lot of pest and disease problems and require treatment for that. Water needs is another thing that's very, very important when selecting a tree. And trees that are more drought tolerant can be quite successful in many landscapes. Nursery stock is the most important thing to start with when you're planting a tree. We as professionals generally look at the ANSI standards, which are the American standards for nursery stock, which will tell you how big root balls, how thick diameters of trunks should be, and other various things that have to do with growing nursery stock. So you should always check that when you buy your stock. There are multiple ways that you can buy trees. You can buy trees in, generally we find them in bare root, bald and burlapped, containerized, or occasionally in what we call fabric or grow bags. There are advantages and disadvantages to using any of these types of nursery stock. Let's start with bare root stock. Bare root nursery stock tends to be quite inexpensive. It doesn't weigh very much, so it's easy to move around. And you can see the root system, which is often where there's problems in trees. The disadvantages to that is that you can't generally get large nursery stock. It tends to be smaller sizes, and they're only available during the dormant season for a short period of time. After that, they tend to need to be planted in containers in order to prevent them from drying out. One of the ways to get more variety in your trees as far as size and even variety of species is to buy them bald and burlapped, where they get dug from a field and put in burlap and then sold at nurseries in that way. There are some problems with bald and burlap stock. One of the things is it can be quite heavy to, to transport and therefore more expensive. Another problem that people sometimes find with these is that they are often planted in clay and then when you plant them in the soil, you can discover that there are some soil interface problems where water doesn't move as easily between the ball and the surrounding soil. Containerized plants have a lot of advantages. They are easy to find. There's a large variety of species and sizes available. And you can plant pretty much all year if they have been in a container. Just like with the bald and burlap, you can sometimes have soil interface problems with plants that have been grown in containers, and they can sometimes be planted too deep in the containers. Probably the biggest problem with them, however, is that they often develop circling or girdling root systems where the roots just go around and around the black plastic pots. Another way that they do grow trees is in what we call fabric bags or grow bags. Grow bags have some advantages in that most of the roots stay within the grow bag and you therefore have many more roots at the time of planting. They can be dug any time of the year, so they are available all year round, unlike some of the bald and burlap stock. 
Some of the disadvantages that people have found with using grow bags is that if they are put in a grow bag and left in a too small bag for too long, you can get circling and girdling roots. The other thing is you have to remove the bag before planting. The most important thing to do before you buy nursery stock is to inspect it, especially for root defects. We were looking for girdling roots, circling roots, which you can find in various types of nursery stock. We're also looking to see if the plant is planted too deep and in which case the tree would not thrive once it was planted. Choosing the right plants for the site and purpose will result in a more long-term functional landscape. It will also reduce the amount of time and money you spend maintaining those plants. Fewer inputs, such as pesticides, fertilizers, and water, will be needed. Improperly planted trees and shrubs are doomed to fail. Yet, a significant number of landscape plants are planted incorrectly, resulting in more problems, more maintenance, and sometimes more pesticides applied. Plant it right. The first thing you should do when you're planting a tree is to locate the topmost root that's in the ball or the container. At the same time, you're looking for any kinds of defects that might be occurring with the roots. And these could include circling roots, especially in containers, girdling and kinking roots that can happen in any kind of production. When you find those, if they are easy to remove by pruning out, you should do it at this time. Once you've located the topmost root and removed any defects that were visible, you want to dig your hole. And at this point, you're trying to dig a hole that is 90 to 95 percent the depth of the ball or container, where the topmost root down to the bottom of that container. Once you've dug the depth of your hole, you want to go out about at least one and a half times the diameter of the root ball that you're working with. It can go a little bit more, but what you ultimately want is a shallow hole that allows that root ball to be sitting high enough that it's not going to be too deep in the soil. Make sure that you keep the native soil that you've dug out because you will be using that again to refill the hole once the tree has been planted. Once you've got the hole dug, make sure that you put some water into that hole and let it drain through so that the soil is moist once the plant gets planted. When you put the plant in the hole, make sure that the topmost root is an, a, an inch, maybe a little bit more, above the soil level. If you have B&B &B plant material or plants that are in a fabric bag or a grow bag, you should place that in the hole before you remove that burlap or grow bag. But you should remove the burlap or grow bag as much as possible once you have the plant seeded in the hole. This is to prevent any kind of girdling of roots that could occur if you don't remove it once you've planted the plant. Remove all of the synthetic ties um, that you may have, especially the orange or blue or yellow polypro that the burlap has been tied with in order to hold it together. If you find that removing the burlap causes some problems and the root ball starts to fall apart, don't take the entire piece out, but cut as low as you can so that none of it is above ground where it can wick out water from the soil. Once you've got your tree settled in the soil, you want to make sure to straighten it so that it looks good from any angle that you're going to be looking at it. At this point, you can start refilling with the topsoil or the soil, garden soil that you have put in a pile next to where you've been planting. And you're going to use, remember, the soil that you removed initially. At this point, you want to water your plant in. And watering it in will help settle the soil, so there's no need at all to stomp on that soil to get the plant settled into the hole. You may find that if your plant is a little bit high, that you're going to have to make a berm around that plant to hold water so that the water is not rolling off the ball. And if you're going to do that, you should use mulch to make that berm. Once you've got the plant settled in the soil, you will want to mulch it so that it will help keep moisture in and help the roots grow. You want to mulch two to four inches on average for most trees. In general, you don't need to stake most trees if they've been planted correctly. You'll only need to do staking of some sort if you are worried about vandalism 
especially in public places, or if you have a tree that's a little bit top heavy or a root ball that's a little bit small for the size of the tree. As far as pruning goes, you should only be removing broken and dead branches at this time. There are several things that you should try to avoid doing. In fact, just don't do them when you plant a tree. One of them, the most important in my mind, is don't plant a tree too deep. Planting a tree too deep can cause root girdling, it can cause other root diseases and dieback in a tree and even death in a tree. If you find a tree that you, has been recently planted poorly, too deep, then you can replant that plant correctly, easily lifting it up and just transplanting it at that time. If you come upon an older tree that has been planted too deep, you want to try to keep it, then what you need to do is remove soil from the trunk and dig down to where you see the uppermost roots and dig out a bit so that it looks like you've created a bowl near the trunk of the tree. This is not ideal, but it is an attempt to try to keep that tree healthy and alive. Another thing you don't want to do when you plant is dig a hole exactly the same size as the root ball. When you do that, you're just moving from one container to another container, and you're not allowing the roots to grow out so that you will have a healthy tree that can get bigger and survive. One of the things that people used to do is prune the top of a tree in order to match the size of the root ball. We know that that is not something that you want to do, as when you do that, you can stress out a tree to a point where they are unable to establish and may even die. Sometimes people think a little mulch is good, but a lot of mulch is better, and that's not true. So if you have too much mulch, over four inches, it's usually going to cause some damage to that tree. One of the things you want to do is make sure it's not on the trunk of the tree where it can cause rot and even rodents will live in that area. You want to make sure that it is not so deep that there isn't enough oxygen at the base of that root ball. If there's not enough oxygen, often those lower roots will die and that will affect the health of the tree. One of the things you can do if there's too much mulch is simply remove it and get it back down to two to four inches. Ideally, it should be tapered so that it's not even touching the trunk. If you do find that you have to stake a tree, these are some things that you don't want to do. One is you don't want to leave it on forever. Ideally, that stake should be left on for no more than one growing season because if it is left on longer than that, it is likely to girdle the trunk of the tree. Most importantly, don't stop watering too soon. Establishment varies on trees depending on their species and their size. But ideally, you want to water a new tree a minimum of two to three times a week, slowly and deeply, and that will help it get established. Just don't stop too soon. When trees and shrubs are planted incorrectly, they do not thrive and can eventually die. Plant it right the first time. If you are maintaining a landscape with plants planted too deep, dig them up and replant them when possible. Mulching with wood chips is a great tool for weed management. It also protects and conditions the soil and keeps moisture in. The result? Healthier landscape plants with fewer problems, which means less pesticide applied. Using wood chip mulch most closely emulates what happens in natural um, systems where you have the falling debris and twigs and seed pods that land on the ground. It's nature's way of mulching um, the ground. So when we use wood chip mulch, we're providing a lot of those same kinds of materials. It has a really nice coarse texture. It supports a wide range of beneficial uh, organisms in the soil ecology. As wood chips uh, break down, um, where the wood chips lay against the soil, they start to decompose and um, slowly turn into compost and cycle uh, nutrients and organic matter back into the ground. A lot of people have some concerns about wood chips. Um, one of the concerns is could they contribute to a disease um, that might travel with them? And the research that's looked into that is it's very rare for that to occur. And some of the best uh, uh, actions 
to reduce that likelihood would be to use wood chips that have had a chance to break down a little bit, um, especially if they've had some heat in their composting um, process. Uh, that's also a nice thing to do because once the wood chips have broken down a little bit, um, they have a little more uniform appearance and you'll get less shrinkage. The other thing that people worry about is nitrogen draw, that wood chips are going to deplete the ground um, of nitrogen. And in the broad scheme, what we see is that if you have wood chips on bare soil, that there's going to be some nitrogen draw right at that soil surface. Um, and that's because the, uh, the microorganisms that are doing that uh, breaking down of the material there are big nitrogen feeders. Um, but it's in a small zone. And then when they're done, we're having nitrogen that's going to be released back into the ground. So it's a short-lived phenomena. And the flip side of that is that, geez, if they're like working and taking all that nitrogen away, it can also suppress weed seedlings from germinating in that zone. So there's, uh, in the broad scheme, actually more benefit than uh, concern about any nitrogen draw. Avoid weed barrier materials, such as landscape fabric and even cardboard. These materials interfere with the movement of beneficial organisms, air, and moisture between the mulch layer and the soil. They also prevent replenishment of organic matter, and they don't stop new weed growth from growing on the surface. So a common practice in planting a new landscape bed is to do the mulch last. Uh, but actually using a coarse mulch like wood chips is a great measure as a pre-planting preparation. So when you've got a bed prepared and you have bare soil, put the mulch down first. It's doing several things for you. First off, when you come to walk through that bed, you're protecting the soil from compaction. Um, if that bed is going to sit a while from the day that you prepped it to the day that you plant it, it'll be protected from compaction from the elements and from rainfall and from erosion. So um, getting those wood chips down immediately will provide those benefits and then depending on the time of year, it might also prevent weeds from starting to come up. So pre-plant method, put in two to four inches of wood chip mulch over the entire bed. Then when you come in to plant, you're gonna scoot that mulch away where each planting hole goes. Expose the bare soil and prepare your planting hole and you're installing your plant as you would normally. When you've done that, you're gonna end up with a ring of thicker mulch right around the planting hole, which is going to be beneficial for suppressing weeds and holding moisture in and um, supporting much stronger establishment of the plants in that landscape bed. And many gardeners have been surprised after trying this to realize that it's actually easier than trying to carefully place that mulch around all these new little plants that have just been laid in a bed. The material in greatest abundance that comes down in the fall and, and covering the earth are leaves. And a lot of times we see them as that burden um, to take those leaves away. And it's actually one of the best materials we can use to maintain and mulch uh, our garden soils. So leaves, as they decompose, they support a lot of beneficial organisms and they contain um, a lot of nutrients that those trees had been um, taking up over the years. So it's a really direct way to get that nutrient cycling back into the soil and the organic matter back into the soil. Um, sometimes the leaves are overwhelming, so a good practice is to scoop away the leaves that are smothering um, areas of the landscape, but don't take every last leaf out of the bed. Leave some behind, and then those leaves that you clean up, get a place to compost them. And so then you can have this great mulch that you can't buy anywhere to bring back and um, cover your, your garden beds with. Sometimes the leaves we get are huge and leathery, so think about big leaf maple and uh, evergreen magnolias, that we might get these leaves that are just so big and leathery they could take a long time to break down. So the simple task there is to just run them through a shredder of some sort and, um, and then uh, put them in your leaf compost pile and they'll break down more quickly. When leaves are partially decomposed, so when you're looking at the pieces, you can recognize little pieces of leaf veins and maybe the, the uh, petiole, um, and it's got kind of a uniform 
dark color. Um, we call that leaf mold. And that's an old horticultural term that simply refers to those leaves that are partially decomposed, still kind of coarse and chunky in texture. And that material makes an excellent mulch for a variety of landscape plantings. And I would say is pretty close in there in the beneficial components as you might get from wood chips. Um, when leaf, leaf pile has had much more time to break down and you scoop up that material and you look at it and it's uniformly brown and crumbly and you can no longer see pieces of leaves or twigs in it, then we've come down to leaf compost. And so that's going to be a really rich, beneficial um, compost to use when you need to amend the soil or you need to top dress to just kind of return some good organic matter um, to the ground. A mulch layer with decomposing wood and leaves will improve water infiltration, suppress weeds, and support the soil food web for improved plant health. Healthier plants means fewer problems and fewer inputs, such as pesticides, fertilizers, and water. It is difficult to mow around trees planted in turf areas. Putting a large mulch ring around young and old trees and turf will protect the trees from fatal mower damage. The tree roots will grow better too and result in better tree health. Trees and turf come from very distinctly different types of ecosystems and then we put them together in a landscape and say play nice. And usually what's going to happen is that, particularly with young trees, the turf is going to be more competitive for resources to the expense of what the tree roots can get. Over time, as trees mature uh, in a lawn area, the grass will start to thin and suffer and, and die out. So the best landscape practice to kind of bridge those situations for each of these plants is to maintain a nice, healthy-sized ring of mulch around the base of the tree. So for young trees, is really significant in reducing the competition between um, turf and tree roots. And when they did studies of what the soil profile looked like underneath wood chip mulch and underneath uh, turf, the tree roots were very uh, scant and thin in, in density beneath turf as compared to underneath wood chip mulch where the roots were really prolific and dense. So the wood chips are really vital to maintaining um, the health and function of the, and growth of the trees. If our trees had suffered drought stress during the summer, uh, mulching in the fall is a great mitigation to that um, stress. A really big mistake people make is doing things like building uh, mulch volcanoes or at the very least just leaving wood chips uh, or any other mulch pressed up against the trunk of the tree. So a really important rule of thumb is to make sure that that trunk flare is exposed and visible and also maintaining probably at least a hand width of bare soil around the base of the trunk. Um, the unfortunate um, tendency that trees will have if the mulch is, is piled up against the trunk is that roots will start to grow up into the mulch and then once they get there, they're confused, it seems, because they go in circles and we end up with a situation of girdling roots, which over time is really deadly um, for the trees. So by keeping a, a space of bare soil around that trunk flare area, that problem is avoided. So you wanna make the mulch um, deeper, farther as you go farther away from the trunk. It is important to mulch all trees and turf areas. This practice reduces turf competition with tree roots. It also provides for easier lawn mowing and trimming near trees, thus protecting the trees from trunk damage, which can kill a tree. Proper watering practices are essential to reduce plant stress from underwatering or overwatering. Maximizing the health of the plants with cultural methods, such as watering, will reduce problems and the unnecessary application of pesticides. 
So the extended period of drought Western Washington has been experiencing over the last few years, on top of our normally drier summer growing seasons, irrigating well is becoming ever more important to maintain um, plant health and survival than it ever was before. One of the best ways to build drought resiliency into a landscape is to water deeply and infrequently. And what that will do is help promote a deeper profile of soil to be occupied by roots and to hold moisture for longer periods of time. It becomes really important when we have those really quick sudden heat waves that can quickly dry out the first couple inches of ground. When the soil is watered, um, and frequently, it also allows it to shrink and swell a bit and maintain good uh, porosity and, and moisture holding capacity. So whether your irrigation system is uh, automatic with all of the latest technology or you're dragging out a hose and using a watering wand at the end, is really vital to use a soil probe or a trowel to check into the ground and see what's actually going on. It's important to check the soil before you apply your irrigation water, um, grab a handful and squeeze it. If you can wring it out like your kitchen sponge, then we can skip that application and uh, come back again later or reset the clock to apply later. Uh, if you, you know, pull, squeeze it and you open your hand and it's just falling apart, it's, you know, really, really dry, then you definitely want to make sure you get your water application on promptly. And you want to check several inches down, not just the first top inch or two. Um, you want to get through the zone where the absorbing roots are actually located. Um, using effective irrigation practices is essential in not only promoting drought resilient plants, but also reducing the potential for pest and disease problems, which in turn would require us to use more pesticide products. So good watering practices, promoting good sturdy drought resilient plants is a great means to reduce the need for pesticide applications. Another important benefit of this uh, method is avoiding the pitfall of overwatering, um, which can also promote poor plant health and mortality. Um, sometimes a plant is wilted and initially it looks like this needs water. And when you check the ground, the ground was already way too wet. And with all that water and not enough oxygen, the roots couldn't get any of that water up and so they wilted. So another side effect of overwatering can be having much more uh, weed growth in our landscape beds and also pushing excess growth on our plants, which can in turn lead to greater pruning demands. So with every site that you're watering, it's important to track what the soil condition is, what type of soil you have. Is it a sandy, free draining soil? Is it heavier clay? Look at your irrigation heads, run your system, and track how that water moves through. See how long it takes for the water to soak in without running off and wetting to the depth that you need. Fine tuning your irrigation system to match the absorption rate of the soil can take a little practice. So you wanna run your irrigation stations or your sprinklers, use the probe, see how far the water went down, um, and then use um, repeat cycles can often be helpful. So you might run it irrigation until um, it's wet, but just before it starts running off and give the ground a little bit of time to rest and for that water to move down with gravity and then come back and do a repeat cycle. And with the repeat cycle, it will help push that water further down into the soil and result in less runoff. Once you have your irrigation system figured out of your heads are set where they should be, you've got the pattern matching to cover where you want covered and um, then you set your irrigation clocks, it's important to come back periodically through the growing season and look at those heads running again. The other thing to monitor is looking at all your equipment delivering with large droplet sizes. The bigger the droplet, the heavier it is. So whether it's from the end of your water wand or it's on a sprinkler head, um, adjust the pressure so that the water is coming out in big heavy drops reduce evaporation and make sure the water is getting to the target, which is in the ground. Look for irrigation heads that give you the flexibility to adjust the spray pattern, um, the size of area that's covered, the size of the droplets, 
and um, will give you flexibility for um, watering different locations. The condition of the surface of the ground can greatly affect how well the water is going to infiltrate and soak in. If the soil has become very dry and hard, um, the water may beat up and roll off and none of it uh, getting down to the plant roots. Uh, fine bark, certain fine textured mulch will also uh, get crusty and pack down really hard and become water repellent. The best condition is to have really coarse, chunky uh, texture mulch um, on top of the ground, which will then provide like big channels for the water to move through and will also um, stay permeable and take up the impact of the water without packing down. So you're starting with rewetting dry soil, uh, crumble up any crusted surface, soak it really well, and then apply your coarse textured mulch over the top, and then you're good to go for the next rotations of irrigation after that. It's not uncommon toward the end of the growing season or in seasons of extremely high extended heat for the soil to get, suddenly get so dry that it becomes what we call hydrophobic. You try to water it and the water just rolls, stays in really tight beads and just rolls right off and just will not wet through. There's a really great trick to get around that and that is to use a wetting agent. And you can get wetting agent um, in horticultural supply um, resources. It comes in granular and liquid forms. Um, chemically, basically, it's a soap. So you could also use mild um, dish soap and put a little bit in a solution and then pre-wet the area that you're going to irrigate. It'll break up the surface tension so that the water will then um, absorb into the soil profile. So keep your irrigation heads running well in uh, turf areas. It's important to come back periodically and uh, make sure you've cut the turf away from around the heads. Um, it's real easy after mowing and people walking for those heads to start to get buried in the soil or for grass to start growing so tightly around them that they don't um, deliver their water as well. During um, drought conditions, um, trying to take care of trees and shrubs that may have become under um, severe drought stress, applying water slowly and deeply is a very important tool. There's several methods um, to do that. Um, soaker hoses are pretty commonly understood. There's also low volume emitter pipes, which have little pressure compensating emitters um, distributed along the length of the pipe. Um, some of those pipes you can also design so they have different size emitter heads that deliver a different amount of gallons per hour um, to match the type of plants that you're watering. So in those systems, the watering is going to be directed at the ground. You're going to have less evaporation. So these systems aren't going to wet the entire bed. That has an advantage of the water going to your plants and not promoting excess weed growth in the beds. When you're using um, these low, slow soak methods, you want to make sure to use a probe to come in afterward and see how deep the water went with your system and also how wide the water moved laterally on each side of the hose. Um, gator bags around new trees have proved to be a very effective way to get trees established where they need a little more water than the rest of the landscape. But once these bags are filled, they have weep holes in the bottom and they slowly um, release the water um, into the ground so you avoid um, runoff problems with that. To apply a deep soaking to an individual tree or shrub that's been particularly drought stressed, another handy tool to use is a bubbler head you can attach to the end of the hose. Um, what this does is simply um, diffuse the water so that it will like gently uh, puddle out and um, slowly soak it. So you're going to run this at low pressure. It's going to let it run uh, for quite a while um, so that it'll slowly um, be able to soak in. There are also some automatic irrigation systems that employ bubbler heads to uh, provide a little slower, gentler soak in specified uh, landscape beds. When hand watering, um, using a water wand that's got a shower head style breaker on the end that will produce really large heavy water droplets is really the most versatile and effective um, nozzle to use when you're hand watering. This shower head style uh, water breaker will uh, give you good uh, dense heavy water droplets that will penetrate and um, soak the ground fairly quickly. Whatever mode of irrigation that you're using to water, from automatic to hand watering to setting up sprinklers, 
Be thoughtful and directed about your water application. Water deeply and infrequently to promote deeper root growth. Using good irrigation practices has the benefits of conserving water, maintaining plant health, and reducing pesticide and fertilizer inputs. Improving soil health, choosing the right plant and planting it correctly, using wood chip mulch, and watering effectively are some of the best management practices that should be used on a regular basis to reduce plant problems over the long term. Proper pruning, mowing, and additional integrated pest management techniques are other BMPs that should be implemented in addition to those covered in this video. By using these methods, you will have healthier plants, make fewer pesticide applications, and conserve water.